What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grud, and welcome to my talk channel. Got another discussion video for you today. For this one, I brought in Chris from Happy Hydro. We talk about environment, particularly indoor grow environment. We talk about the temperature, humidity, CO2, and air circulation. Y'all have made it very clear that you wanna see more of these type of discussion videos. The video I did with pigeons on plant training has over 105,000 views right now. The video I did with Rob from CLTV talking about plant nutrients, that has over 175,000 views as of right now. So y'all have made it clear that you wanna see more of these discussion videos and uh, got one for you today. The audio on this video is actually recorded onto one channel. So Chris's voice on it is slightly lower than mine. In the future, I'll make sure to record on two channels so that way the audio will be better in the future. But it's still pretty good. You can still listen to it, so don't click away just yet. Let's get into the video. All right, we're here. What's up, Chris? How you doing? Good, man. How are you? Good, good. Ready to Stop talk to about... Here. Awesome. Ready to talk about environment or what? Let's do it. All right. So we'll cover... Uh, let's cover temperature, humidity... Um, let's get into CO2 and then air circulation. So it basically covers everything that has to do with uh, plants environment. How's that sound? Sounds great, man. Um, you're located on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. We're dealing with different natural outside environments, which um, affects, you know, inside environments. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, there's not, people don't really have basements on the West Coast, right? Yeah, I don't have a basement. Now it's just, yeah, on the East Coast, you guys, almost every house has a basement, right? Yeah, like every house in Buffalo pretty much has a basement, and it's really a good spot to grow in terms of like trying to keep things private, maybe like from family, friends, visitors. You know, it's a, it's a good way to keep things separated, but there's, when I say it's a good place to grow, it's not an easy place to grow in terms of like, you know, humidity, temperature, and, and controlling things. So I take it you grow in basements? I've grown in basements in the past. The biggest issues that you have is a lot of basements aren't completely waterproof or sealed. You know, you get like a basement that has cracks in the walls and stuff, and you can easily find yourself dealing with uh, mold, mildew, and just like things like that that can really screw up a grow. Um, it's not the optimal place to grow but when you you know if you have a two-bedroom house and a roommate and there's nowhere to grow and you got a basement it's like well obviously we're gonna um utilize that space if possible so uh we have to look out for cold concrete floors you know it's it's you don't want to just set your plants on the cold concrete floors in a basement um and also just in the summertime dealing with humidity um, dealing with the extreme cold in the winter. Um, those are some of the challenges, but it is a common area that people do grow in. And I, uh, I think that, um, people could get some value out of some, uh, tips on how to grow down there if you're on the East coast. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we can definitely talk about that. Um, so let's start off with temperature. So me living on the West coast, I actually live in a very dry climate, a very hot climate. I live in a desert region. Um, you're in a more humid climate since you're on the East coast. Uh, you have bodies of water around you. Um, it's a lot more humid. Uh, it's a lot more colder. Um, so I think our discussion, I'm pretty excited to have you on here in particular because you live in such an opposite climate that I do. Um, and so there are different pieces of equipment that we use in order to control temperature, humidity, so on and so forth. So kind of starting with temperature. Um, so the ideal temperature that I usually aim for when I'm growing my plants is anywhere between um, 70 degrees and about 82 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly. That's kind of ideal. Now, some people may be watching this. They have may, have, may have read my book and saw it was slightly different than that. Um, what's in my book is kind of a general guideline for that. I'm kind of narrowing that down to be a little bit more ideal. Leaf surface temperature of 82 is what I've heard to be ideal. So I kind of aim for that. If that means that the canopy temperature is a little bit higher than that to achieve that uh, leaf surface temperature of 82, uh, that's okay. Um, now, as far as how low it goes, I had mentioned 70. It's okay. You know, if it goes into the 60s, that's fine. I actually do like to drop my temp 
in the 60s towards the end of flowering. Um, that way I, it, it tends to bring out some of the colors in some of the phenotypes that, that I've grown. Um, so going I'll down to the 60s is is fine for me. Like the, the plant will still grow just fine uh, in that range, but having a swing greater than, um, you know, 10, 15, once you get up to upwards of a 20 degree swing between day and nighttime temperatures, that's when, you know, you might want to cause for alarm or might be stressing out the plants too much. So I would, um, I would agree with you. And I think that I would do pretty much the same thing. But one thing on the East coast that we have to look out for is if, if we drop the temperature down to 60 degrees in late bloom and we are not aware of our humidity levels and we have like high humidity, low temperatures, um, you know, it's a prime time opportunity for powdery mildew to start growing in your plants. Like, um, I've dealt with it in the past, having like too cool of a, of a bloom at night with too high of a humidity, um, from, you know, growing in the summer or growing in a, a basement that doesn't have a, a knock, a basement that's not completely dry or, um, or even growing in an upstairs like bedroom or something that you just can't, uh, if you don't do a good job of keeping your humidity uh, low, you can definitely have issues with powdery mildew with cool uh, temperatures and late bloom. So I would warn people to watch out for that. And then um, another thing I wanted to well, what, mention. What, you, you, what, what percent is high RH? Do you consider high that you're at risk for powdery mildew? I mean, if you're in late bloom and you're, and you're over 60% humidity, I think you're starting to creep into dangerous um territories i mean i'm sure it's debatable um but, no you know, i agree with starting... you on that one i've had bud rot uh in late bloom yeah. you know big large dense buds higher humidity not enough air circulation that that in, is involved in this as well and with powdery and mildew and it happens uh, yeah and it's so depressing <laughs> when it happens yeah yeah because <laughs> it's like you've just spent three months maybe four months doing all this work and you're you know about to trim or you're about to be cutting down soon and you find that powdery mildew and stuff and it's like oh man like what do we do <laughs> do we now we have to throw a lot of this out like wow um, it's terrible, but to, to rewind a little bit, you mentioned the, uh, plant canopy and leaf temperature surface. And one thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, if you're using like a grow room monitor, such as like the pulse sensor or sensor push or any really temperature, uh, it could be like a $12, you know, Walmart, uh, temperature thing with the probe or whatever that probe you're going to want to have in your canopy. Um, the temperature at your canopy on top of your canopy could be different than the temperature, uh, you know, in the, in the side of your room or whatever. So uh, I think it's important for people to know that they want to take their temperature levels at the canopy where the plants are, um, because it can be different throughout the room. Yeah, I agree with that. I know some people who have a room temperature, they also have that canopy temperature. I know some people actually put it down by the soil so they can get kind of get an idea of what the soil level temperature is. Now, of course, if you have that humidity monitor just resting on top of your soil, it could kind of be inflated as far as the humidity number, for example. Um, you know, if you have a, a, a wet medium, water. moist medium, yeah. And that's not going to give you a real accurate rep representation of what your temperature is in the soil right it's kind of like above the soil but it kind of gives you a, a general um general idea of what uh you know your temperature and humidity is at the, at the soil level so yeah canopy level great call out is to get measurements there for sure um and then you know you mentioned bud rot and and uh you're uh, cooling your temperatures down in late bloom and stuff but one thing that you can do or that growers can do to avoid that issue even if the humidity does get get high in the room is to have good air circulation. So I know this was on your list of things to talk about. Um, when you have good air circulation, it makes it hard for uh, mold and mildew to grow. So having, you know, the leaves on your plants just like, you know, moving a little bit, signifying that there is good flow coming through the canopy is going to prevent um, the possibility of a lot of like mold and mildew and bud rot and stuff like that. I do want to take a step back and talk about temperature just a little bit more. Um, so yep. if the temperature is one thing that I use to regulate the temperature um, in my grow environment is uh, an inline fan. Um, I use the AC Infinity inline fan, which I know that you are uh, 
familiar with. I use the T6 model uh, for my 4x4 grow tent. And I have, it, it, for those of you who don't know about the AC Infinity fan, there's a controller on it. And this fan is, is pretty advanced compared to other fans. You can actually have set points on it. It has a probe and set points. So you can actually hang that probe and canopy level. And you can have the set points for certain temperature and humidity. So what I have it set for is uh, the temperature at 82. Um, so once the temperature actually goes up and reaches 82, it will uh, my AC Infinity fan will turn on and it will start to exhaust some of that hot air. And then of course my lung room or the room that my uh, grow tent is in has air that is around room temperatures, usually around 70, 72 degrees. So that uh, air is coming into the grow tent, passive intake. And then again, once that hot air is being exhausted, the fan will automatically uh, turn off. Um, so it's intermittently coming on, uh, controlling and kind of keeping that temperature around 80, 82 degrees uh, when the lights are on. Now when the temperature is too low, uh, so say it goes down below my ideal temperature, like I mentioned, uh, you know, 70 roughly, if it goes in the 60s, that's okay, but I have a heater in my lung room. So lung room, the room that my grow tent is in, um, I have a heater. So I try to stabilize the temperature at around 70 degrees, 72 degrees, for example. Now on my heater, there is a, a feature on there which is going to, you can put the, you can set the temperature. So uh, if the temperature drops below that set point, it's gonna kick on. Um, so my lung room is stable at all time due to the heater and then as my grow light is on and it's exhausting with that hot air, that stable um, air coming in about 70 degrees is coming into my grow tent. So my fan is coming off and on. So that's how I uh, regulate temperature in my grow space. Um, and then one other thing to mention was the uh, sensor push. Sensor push, pulse, those are monitors that you can use within your grow space. I personally use a sensor push one. I actually just got the, the pulse one, thanks to you. Uh, I haven't used it yet, though. But, gotcha, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, having that canopy level as well and getting alerts through your smartphone because it's an app that you connect and tells you what the temperature is, what the humidity is. You can just see it on your app. You don't actually have to go into your grow room. Um, so it, using it those records, pieces of automation. Right? Uh, what do you mean records like it records the data over time so oh, yeah. you can go back and you can look at your graphs and be like oh on i noticed that every november this happens you know what i mean on the graph it gets too cold in my room so i know i need to have a heater in november like you can go back and analyze the data um or like i know that like i'm noticing that in the middle of the night it gets too cold or, or it gets too hot in the day or you know whatever Exactly, exactly. Go back and yep, and you can also do the set points as well on sensor push where you can get notifications on your phone, right? So if the, the temperature drops, Ooh. yeah, so the temperature drops too low, I'll get alert. Then I can go into my room, figure out, hey, why is this heater not working? Do I need to increase the temperature? So on and so forth. Or if it gets too high, right? Maybe, maybe uh, you know, something went wrong to where my lung room, the temperature is too high. Um, so the air coming into the grow tent is too high. So that I need to make adjustments, maybe add an air conditioner, for example. So that how does it work with you? You're, you're, you're talking about this, um, the sensor push and how it can give you alarms to your phone. This technology of like those types of alarms, greenhouses have been using for forever. Um, so my wife, her grandfather owns or owned a greenhouse. He's, he's passed away and the business was closed. But um, in his greenhouse, they had alarm so it didn't go to your smartphone they had an, a, a a wire ran so there was an alarm in their bedroom in the house like in front of the greenhouse so if it was too cold or too hot um you know the alarm would go off at three in the morning and they'd have to wake wake up and go out there you know they've got a ten thousand dollar crop they gotta uh, make sure it doesn't die so uh, i just think it's funny how the technology is still kind of the same but like now it's like oh right on my phone like i don't have to have an alarm like beow, 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 <laughs> in my bedroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah so d when the temperature reaches too low i'm using a, a heater you know in my lung room temperature is too high um, i have actually have a central air conditioning is what i've used i've used those uh, portable air conditioners before very inefficient, uh, didn't have good luck. I mean, temperature was super stable, don't get me wrong, but as far as energy consumption, it was oh, super dude, expensive. 
Yeah. Um, so I, I've avoided using that. I just use my central AC now. Uh, that's just in my area. Uh, like I mentioned, my climate that I live in, I live in the desert region. So I'm able to kind of get away with that. What do you do? Do you, do you have to run a heater and do you have to run any sort of uh, air conditioning too? So, um, on the East coast, if you're, if you're growing in like your house where you have, you know, central air or, um, heat, it's going to be very similar to what you're dealing with. It's not going to be a whole lot different. Um, but, you know, if you're growing in a space where you don't have, like, for example, uh, a friend of mine is growing in his basement. And um, what he does in the wintertime is he runs a couple of the Grower's Choice 500-watt uh, CMH lights uh, instead of running LED lights because he actually uses the heat from the lights to keep the grow space warm. Uh, and then when they shut off, he's got, um, you know, a heater down there. And I, I think he actually uh, vented his like heater for his house to like be able to uh, produce heat into the basement grow room as well. But um, yeah, that's something that people in cold environments can do. You know, LEDs are efficient and they save on heat. But if you need heat, use an HPS or a CMH. Yep. Yeah, it's going to generate uh, a lot more heat and, and, and heat up your grow space. I know growers who that's what they run in the winter time is HPS so they can warm up their grow space and yep. then in the summertime they go to LED. Yep, yep. That's um it's pretty common on the East Coast. At least uh for the people I know and the growers that I've met in the local grow shops and stuff when I work there. Let's talk about humidity. Should we shift gears over to humidity. So humidity uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about humidity, um, what the ideal range is. I know a lot of people go again go for VPD. A VPD vapor pressure deficit. Uh, we won't get into too much detail, but what that is, feel free to Google if you want to learn more. But basically, uh, your humidity level goes by the temperature, uh, leaf surface temperature to be more exact. Some people just use the, the temperature in the grow room to kind of chase after VPD, but it does call for higher higher humidity than, than normal, right? And you do come across risks for things such as bud rot, uh, pottery mildew, what, mold, what things like that. For, uh... What calls for higher humidity than normal? VPD. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if I, you're running like 80 degrees, I mean, we can bring up the chart right now. Let me see if I can summarize VPD for, for those who might not know. Basically, like, your plant is going to release uh, moisture from its leaves based on how humid it is in the room. Yeah, transpiration, yep. So, so, it transpires, uh, it releases humidity. transpire out of the leaves into the room. And if the room is very humid, it will transpire at a lower rate. If the room is really dry, it's going to transpire at a, at a faster rate, yep. which is going to affect how often you have to water the plant and the, the health of the plant and how it's producing cells and um, – growing yeah i mean that's one thing i run into is a very low humidity uh transpiration increases if i'm running synthetic nutrients for example bottom nutrients of feeding the plant it could run into very run very well run into a toxicity issue it's happened before to where you have too oh, much I yeah because your plant's drying out uh the medium a lot quicker it's uptaking nutrients quicker there's a plant available nutrients you can run into toxicity issues with low humidity so kind of bringing up wow. that humidity um, but getting back to the VPD, I'm looking at the chart right now. So, for example, if you're running a temperature of 84 degrees, it's calling in the green area for about 70, 74 to 78% humidity. So that's just give you an idea. That's, you know, some people are hearing that and like, oh, wait, that's, that's way higher than what I'm running right now. Some people might uh, hear that number and they might be like, oh, I hear pottery mildew, uh, <laughs> pottery mildew knocking at the door. You know, so yeah. um, it's risky. I think well, chasing a, after VPD, I think, is definitely risky. The general range that I usually aim for is between 40 and 60 percent. Um, so I can avoid pottery mildew, you know, bud rot when it comes into flowering, so on and so forth. What um, what percent humidity do you usually aim for? Well, let's um, I'd like to just talk about early veg for a minute. Um, well, seedling clone and early veg, because I feel like that is a point in time where humidity is extremely important. And um, a lot of people have issues with their plants during these periods that they think are due to pH, nitrogen, toxicity, or not enough nutrients. Um, 
whatever. Like it's hard to sometimes pinpoint if you're not tracking your humidity well. Uh, the the uh, the general consensus really is that you have to have high humidity in uh, early veg and for your seedlings and clones, or they just they they don't grow well. Yeah, you bring up a great point. I, I should have said that. It's crazy the difference that it makes. Like I've I've seen a grow, maybe I was even involved in it, that had, you know, just vegging plants that just look like shit. And mm. you're like, why is this happening? Like, what do we do? We, you know, we go through the list and we try to narrow it down. You know what? Let's introduce a ton of humidity uh, to the room and get it up to, you know, 70%. Three days later, all of the plants are just, I call it praying for light when the leaves are just like, they just look so happy. Like, mm. um, so I think like early veg, it, one of the biggest problems that people have that they overlook or don't put, put enough kind of like uh, effort or whatever into is, is figuring out or is getting their humidity up. So uh, one thing I saw, which is really cool from Seed to Stoned, he has these little plastic domes hmm. that he puts. Oh, so he transplants his seedlings or his clones into the pot. And then he has these like plastic domes that he puts over them which acts as like a little humidity dome and keeps the humidity up uh, as the plant transitions into its new vegetative state and uh, uh, new pot. And I've seen you do it with like plastic bags. Plastic bags Um, over the cups, yeah. That helps with seedlings for sure. Which is cool too, yeah. But one of the biggest changes that I made like as an early grower was introducing more humidity into veg and just, it's just, it's a a big, um, big difference. Yeah, you bring up a great point. I, I should have said it earlier when I mentioned that the forty to sixty percent, the forty sixty forty to sixty percent that I mentioned earlier is really for for veg and flower. Those are safe routes. Now, when you're in seedlings, clones, um, I run higher than sixty percent. I, I aim for like sixty five to eighty five percent is kind of typically what I aim for uh, on that avenue. And then when they're in veg, um, you know, mid veg is when, uh, you know, I get below 60%. And that goes against VPD. You know, some people are going to say that this isn't ideal. Uh, we're just kind of talking general range that the, the plant will grow in here. Um, so I think that's a kind of a general range. So like I mentioned before, I live in a very dry climate. Um, so I have to actually run a humidifier at all times, 24-7. Uh, two humidifiers, actually. I have two humidifiers in my lung room. Uh, in my veg tent, I have a humidifier, too. In my flower tent, I don't need to run a humidifier most of the time. Um, we, also run a, we also run a humidifier in uh, a veg tent in this climate. Oh, you do? In the veg area in this climate, yeah. Okay. I've heard a lot of people. Most of the time. Hmm. I've heard um, a lot of people. But, I know my friend lives in Boston, and uh, he's, I mean, he's right on the water, so humidity is just naturally high. I mean, 60% plus uh it's just naturally i know in florida too it's it's crazy so people have to run a dehumidifier all the yeah. time or else you i have, mean powdery you mildew is on deck mm, you're both on deck just in case just in case because you know the, with the seasons changing i mean winter you know if you have forced air in your house in the in the winter time it's getting dry or mm. in the winter just gets drier in general over here it's honestly a pain in the ass because if you're not really caught, if you're not paying attention to the seasons, especially if you're a new grower, like, you know, you go, you have this amazing grow because you did it in the perfect time of season. And then you go to do your next grow and you're like, you know, why, why what's happening? Why, why aren't things healthy? The seasons changed and the humidity is different. So we keep both, we keep the humidifier on deck and the dehumidifier. And we just try to really pay attention to the season changes so you have them on at all times in the room even if you don't need it or do you only bust out the dehumidifier like on certain seasons we bust out the dehumidifier for usually uh mid to late veg and then Mm. into uh the drying phase like we don't we don't crank it during the drying phase because if you dry your stuff too fast it's just not good it'll smell like hay and um not good so we don't crank it but we run it in the summer we usually don't run it in the veg we usually don't have to at all even in like mid late veg um yeah we, we run in the summer in the winter we just run it basically in late 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 bloom uh and in the drying phase uh the humidifier we run in the winter to, we're running it in veg actually mostly year round um like i said i just find that the veg op like 
the veg plants grow so much faster uh, with good humidity. Um, so we don't really use the humidifier in bloom ever, I don't think. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really think we do. And if, if we do, it's only for, like, the beginning for, you know, a little while, first couple of weeks or something. Hmm. But, yeah, that's a good example of how it's it's different for me. Like, I'd never run a dehumidifier and need to. Uh, wintertime, like you mentioned, the, the heat forced hot air, uh, you know, I have a, a gas forced hot air uh, heating system. It does lower that humidity. Uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, it was 18% the other day. 18%. Wow. That's crazy, crazy low. So I'm constantly yeah, battling cool, that man. low humidity. And that's why I have to run multiple humidifiers in the climate I live in. And it's just a perfect example how two different climates, two different setups, you just got to, you know, uh, figure it out. There's so much balancing. I get so many growers asking me that questions about what they need to do. And they live in a different climate. So it's like, uh, they, it's like different than what I would do. And so it's just a matter of uh, tinkering with your equipment and, and figuring it out, I think. I think this is a good segue into discussing CO2. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, using CO2, the most ideal way and efficient way to do it is in a sealed room, right? Because if you're not, if you're just exhausting all your CO2 out the window, it's, you know what I mean? You're going to go through tons of tanks or, you know, propane if you're using a CO2 burner or um, it's just not extremely effective to run co2 and then just like exhaust uh, outside mm -hmm. so the long room is a fantastic way to uh to, to have like a a good co2 system where you know the co2 gets goes into the grow tent and then it gets pumped out into the long room you know that long room is going to have a higher co2 content like the the, the co2 is going to stay in there that the plant isn't the plants aren't consuming um it's going to sink to the floor because it's heavier than air and the passive intake on your grow tent i assume is at the bottom hmm. so the co2 is just going to get sucked you know back into the tent naturally and uh kind of just keep going into the tent into the long room into the tent into the long room and um and you're so you're using tmb naturals um co2 canisters correct yes and you you shake those up like once a day and they um do you do you like hang it above your plants or do you just set it on the ground so guidance from tmb naturals we you can do a couple things uh number one is you can hang it above your plants because co2 is a heavy gas it's gonna it's gonna sink down so um your co2 will, will sink down there or if you have an oscillating fan within your environment they had mentioned it's fine to place it like around that um, either in front of the oscillating fan or behind the oscillating fan. Um, so that way it's, it's blowing the CO2 around. Uh, I've just been putting it on the ground. I've hung it above my plants before. I actually think my CO2 tank is, uh, the, the canister is actually out right now. I need to refill it. Um, I haven't been monitoring the CO2 uh, recently. I have gone grows where I've monitored the CO2 very closely. With those TMB naturals, it, it kind of varies, especially since I'm living in the house that I grow in human respiration, my, I'm exhaling CO2, I have a roommate, I have pets, um, that is actually sufficient. So when I go in my uh, room, my lung room alone, it's like 600, 800 PPM of CO2. And oh, when without? I'm, yeah. Without the... Without TMB naturals. Now, there, with a, when I got TMB naturals in there, place. plus my human <laughs> respiration, I'm over, up over 1,000 oftentimes, 1,000, oh, wow. uh, 1,200. Uh, I know a lot of growers, uh, ideally, they had mentioned 1,000 to 1,500 when you're using like a CO2 tank, for example, which I know you have experience on and there's a regulator and so on and so forth. Um, is that typically what you aim for or what do, you, what do you aim for when it comes to CO2 and how do you manage it? I think, I think if people are, are using supplemental CO2, they're, they're you know, ideally trying to hit 1,000, 1,200 at the very least. Uh, before I get into the tank, so I wanted to ask you, is there a specific reason that you decided to go with the CO2 uh, canisters from TMB rather than like the mushroom bags or tanks or um, they sent them to know, me. whatever? Sent them to me for free. <laughs> Try it out. <laughs> yeah. That's a that's a good answer. That's that's the reason <laughs> why. Yeah, I've seen those bags and those bags. I've heard a lot of people say they're much more effective. There's some that I think last for 365 days or something like that. I think the exhale bags. Uh, but I haven't used those. So we used to, I used to sell them in the grocery store I worked at here. We don't sell them on Happy Hydro yet, but um, 
you know, we had one set up in the store and we, and we had a, a, a monitor on it and it kept the tent, you know, 900 to a thousand. And I'm pretty sure as long as the, the mushrooms are, or the mycelium is growing, as long as it's growing, it's producing CO2 constantly. So basically I, I you know, someone can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but as long as that bag is, is alive and producing more CO2 and growing, it, it can last as long as you keep it alive. But they are, you know, it is introducing another living thing into your room to, that you kind of have to keep an eye on and and kind of keep alive. I mean, if you just throw that mushroom bag two feet away from a thousand watt HPS light or something, I'm, I'm pretty sure that light will dry it out or kill it. Or And there are cheaper methods to the bags and the canisters. Uh, there's actually home remedy methods. It seems like every time... Every time I release a, a video where I show the TMA Naturals or, or talk about CO2 in some sense, there's always somebody in the comment section who lists off a super cheap way to do their own CO2 and their own their own method of doing it. I don't have it memorized. I've never tried it, but there's super cheap ways in order to um, create CO2 on your own without buying canisters, bags, yeah. tanks, uh, so on and so forth. But you, you run the tanks sometimes, right? You used to run the tanks? I have. I have. CO2 tanks. So the biggest thing, like if anyone's using CO2 tanks right now and they're getting them from their local hydro store and they're swapping them out at the local hydro store, um, it needs to be known that those tanks were inside of other grow rooms. And if other people aren't clean and they have bugs, those bugs get on the tank, they come back to the, to the grow store, they go to the CO2 you know, factory, wherever they fill them. Long story short, they come back to the grocery store and then they go to your room. So I would tell everybody who walked into the grow shop uh, here in Buffalo that I worked at, bleach your tank before you put it in your room. Uh, take a take a washcloth with some bleach water and just bleach it down because... Properly you know, diluted. I'm, properly diluted. Yeah. <laughs> it would just really suck to, to swap your CO2 tanks out and then have... Uh, spider mites because the guy before you wasn't a clean grower or or maybe your grow store isn't the cleanest grow store you know who knows but yeah anything that you're bringing into your room and swapping out regularly like co2 tanks i definitely recommend cleaning um how much does it cost for a co2 tank and regulator and all that stuff oh it depends on where you go um hmm. I, I remember uh, tank refills were like 20 bucks uh, to buy the tank full for the first time, I think is probably 80 to 100 bucks, depending on where you go. Um, and if you're in a sealed room, it lasts, what, two weeks or something, roughly? It depends on depends how on... big the room is, you know, like I, yep. if you're and how efficient you are, like sealed room is a very loose term uh, because a, I, a lot of people may think their rooms are sealed, but they're not. Um, it's hard to get a perfectly sealed room. Like I'm sure there's plenty of people who have done it, but uh, there's always going to be little spots for stuff to leak out. And um, but the tanks, you know, you can get three, four weeks out of a tank in a smaller area if you're um, efficiently sealed and hmm. and everything. And you know, the cool thing about it is if you hook it up to the, the monitor and the controller and everything, you can keep that CO2 level exactly where you want it. Mm. And you can take, uh, they make this perforated hose that comes off the end of the tank, and then you hang the perforated hose right above your canopy. So it's just, you know, raining CO2 right over your canopy. Mm. Um, and since we're talking about canopies and CO2, something that... Um, we should be aware of is that the, the plant leaves are absorbing CO2 as the CO2 approaches uh, the edges of the leaf. Like it's only consuming CO2 right by the leaf. So if you don't have good circulation or like constant flow of CO2, um, CO2 is heavier than air. So it's, it's going to the ground at all times. If you don't have circulation, pushing that CO2 around and back up, keeping your plant leaves kind of moving a little bit, um, the plant is going to consume the CO2 around the leaf. And then, you know, if it's just stagnant air, it's not going to get more CO2. You, you have to have circulation or, or uh, some sort of, you know, distribution, distribution system 
uh, dropping the CO2 onto the leaves, ideally constantly to really get the most out of it. Yeah, and then it always kind of worried me with the seedlings, with the, the, the bag over the cup. We talked about that earlier. It's like there's no air circulation going on there. How is that seedling still growing? So, like, it, when it's small, when the plants are small like that, you can kind of get away with having the bag over for 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, whatever. Um, or, like you said, Seed to Stone has this whole dome that he puts over. I think those yeah. domes actually have a, a ventilation um, slots, so you can, you can open it up. Um, but... Yeah, for a short period of time, and, and when the plant is small, you can kind of get away with it. But uh, but yeah, you bring up a very valid point: is that air circulation is definitely needed uh, in order to to maximize uh, you know CO two intake. And so you were saying that like just you and your cat and your roommate and everything like produce enough CO two in the house and in that room, like if you're spending time in there, to where you don't need a whole lot of supplemental CO two. So. Based on that, we can say that talking to your plants makes them healthier, right? Yeah. Yeah, somebody commented on my, one of my videos, and they're like, oh, you just put your gym in there, right? You just what? Put your gym in there. Then you'd be constantly... <laughs> oh, your gym. <laughs> yeah. Start working out in there, do push-ups, don't, jumping don't, jacks. Don't wear a mask in your grow room. <laughs> so, speaking of ambient CO2, if you don't have a sealed room and you're, and you're exhausting... Um, you know, out the window or like whatever. The ambient CO2 in the in the world is between 250 and 400. I think it's closer to 400 and varies on, on where you live. Um, it is rising, um, but there's tons of like big greenhouse grows and stuff that just can't afford and don't have sealed environments to, to uh, implement uh, external CO2. So they just use the ambient CO2 and in order to do that, you just really have to have good airflow and uh, circulation, you know, keeping those, like I said earlier, keeping those leaves moving. Um, you, you can still achieve good yields with ambient CO2, um, but these new LED lights that are coming out, um, such as the ROI E720, they produce so much light that I'm pretty sure that in order to get the most out of the light, to get the plant to be able to keep up and photosynthesize the amount of light that's being produced uh, by those, uh, they they need CO2. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, commercial facilities, these are the commercial grow lights, right? These are the, There's a reason why they're, they're, they're labeled commercial grow lights is because in commercial facilities, they regulate CO2 and they're able to have the uh, additional par hit their plants um there are so many home growers who just fry their plants with these new grow lights it's becoming more and more common even at the proper light distance it's still they just don't have the co2 um, they have low levels of co2 so their, their plants just aren't able to handle it um, you bring up a really great point with that one so yeah increasing the co2 in your grow space um, will allow you to intake more of that par and also, it allows you to deal with higher temperatures. Um, your plant can handle more extremities when it has more CO2. Like, I'm pretty sure it can handle more nutrients, too. Seems like it just kind of like turbocharges the, the photosynthesis process so the plant can just handle more. It definitely helps, uh, but... You know, it's definitely not a requirement. So I know some. I could have a lot of new growers on right. this channel, and uh, some of them might be thinking that they need to start implementing CO2. You don't have to. The natural levels uh, that are there is going to allow your plant to grow just fine. Um, I think the amount of yield that it increases, as far as like a ROI, return on investment, adding CO2 versus not having CO2, I think that's a bit debatable. I think it depends on the uh, the method of CO2, how much you're actually spending, right? If you're spending a bunch of money on canisters versus a bunch sealed. of money on those bags. Yeah, if you're sealed. If you're, so there's too many variables uh, to really um, uh, talk about that one. But um, Dude, when I was a new grower, I freaking walked into a hydroponics store and like, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, I just, it was like my brain shut off and I, I'm no, I'm no longer just growing a plant. They made it seem like I needed the world to, to grow this plant, right? Like, oh man, it was, I, I didn't know what I needed and what I didn't need, right? Because they just wanted to sell me everything. Like, oh yeah, you're starting to grow CO2? Definitely, definitely <laughs> going to need 
sealed. I'm like, okay, well, I have three hundred dollars, and uh, the bill is one thousand. So how do we? What do I? What do I really need to just get going? Truth is, you don't need CO2 to get going. Uh, you don't need a million bottles of nutrients. Really, you're just growing a plant like any other plant, and and uh, keeping it simple as a beginner. I wish I would have done that. I did not, dude. I got. I overcomplicated things so much that it was just, it was a disaster. The moral of the story is about that is like as a new grower, like it's 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 really hard to navigate and figure out like what you actually need and what you don't. And at the end of the day, you need a little nutrients, you need a little light, you need a little dirt and a little bit of water, and some good temperatures, right? Like you know, environment is key. Age. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And I think one other thing that we do need is air circulation, right? Let's let's start talking about that, and we'll, we'll wrap up w- with that one. Is air circulation is, is just so key for for so many different reasons. Um, CO two, we already talked about how it is important for CO two. If you have stagnant air, your uh, plants aren't getting the optimal amount of CO two because um, it's directly right by the leaf is is really what matters for for them intaking co2 so air circulation is very important you had mentioned that you like those plants to be dancing at all times i agree with that just a little bit yeah. you know. yep i agree with that um i also aim for that what i do is i'll have an oscillating fan above the canopy or, or right yeah right above the canopy um so my plants are able to sway from that so there's air circulation there and i also have a oscillating fan on the lower part of my canopy um you know it's usually on the ground and it's blowing i actually have those clip-on fans now that uh, clip directly under the grow tent so this is super easy i can just adjust the height on the grow tent but above the canopy below the canopy uh, those are two things i usually aim for and that's usually gives good air circulation that plus my inline fan popping on and off for air exchange that's usually pretty simple method um that's usually what i aim for now i've run one oscillating fan in the past and it died overnight and uh when i found it there's some part there was some bud rot that already started and once it starts even if you fix that issue it still can continue to grow within the buds uh, and unfortunately two weeks later i harvested and then uh drying came and i opened it up to some some bud rot so that that wasn't good but so now i'm running two oscillating fans in my grow tent at all times what do you usually do for air circulation it's just to kind of rewind and talk about oscillating fans um you know that i've been doing tons of research into oscillating fans because i'm trying to find a high quality one to bring uh, onto the happy hydro website Mm -hmm. and what i've found is that most of these oscillating fans the smaller six inch ones suck like they die on you like you said you had one die um and so I mean, I think it's worth mentioning that if, if any cost, if anyone out there is doing is looking to get an oscillating fan to do your research, I'm not going to call out brands specifically in the video, but do your research and make sure the brand that you're purchasing from, you know, has a high quality fan, a high quality uh, oscillating fan. Because like you said, they do. If it's a low quality quality fan, they do eventually die out. And um, when they do. Three months worth of work. Can, can be out the out the window so you know is, is saving ten dollars on your oscillating fan worth risking a failure i don't think it is i have no problem mentioning brands if they if they have defective products the one that you're i think you're talking about is the the vivo sun or, or some people call it vivo sun I, I think it's i don't know which way it's pronounced i've been saying vivo sun and they haven't corrected me on it, so <laughs> I'm going to run with that. But um, I've been talking with them about that in particular because I did have a fan that died from them. And if you look on the reviews, it was just flooded with people who have that fan uh, that would die on them. And what they had mentioned is that they have revised that fan so that issue no longer happens. What was happening, the root cause for that is as the fan was oscillating, the wiring inside was constantly rubbing up against the side. And then there was basically kind of a, like a, a short circuit. I don't, I don't think that's the right term for it, but the wiring would just I know get what you're saying. yeah, the wiring would just get um, annihilated from moving back and forth. It would it would wear out, and then it would no longer um, have the electricity to the fan. They said that they fixed that problem. We'll see if that new generation of fans, if that problem is fixed or not. But yeah, you bring up a great point. I'm not point. willing to be a guinea pig for it. <laughs> <laughs> neither, neither will I uh, put my customers up to that. Um, if they yeah. do fix it and uh, 
you know, they put out a good product that, you know, I'd be happy to distribute uh, a, a quality product. But um, until that's, you know, verified, um, we probably won't have a Vivo Sun fan on Happy Hydro's site right now. I'll be the guinea um, pig. <laughs> perfect. I'll be the guinea pig. If, if the new one they send me is legit, then hey, I'll, well, let, you, I'll let you know. If you get if you get bud rot, I think you should send them a bill for your lost <laughs> harvest. <laughs> It'd be nice if I could do that. That'd be really nice. <laughs> oh, man. But what do you do um, usually do for air circulation? So a cheap thing that people can do um, that's pretty reliable is to just buy a cheap box fan, mm-hmm. take two uh, grow light hangers, hang it from the ceiling, and have it blowing air right between the top of the canopy and uh, the light fixture. Okay, um, so vertical. It's vertical. It's not. You're not talking about horizontal on the top of the grow tent. Vertical, right? right vertical. Right. Okay, so like the side well, of the grow yeah, tent. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's like just like a cheap way to, to to really move a lot of air. I mean, a box the box fan will move a ton of air. Um, how did you how do you affix it up? Just like hang it from grow light hangers. Grow light hangers. Okay. Yeah. And then it can just blow, you know, it's not ideal for like a four by four grow tent, but if you're growing in like a bedroom or something um, mm. and, you, and you need to move a lot of air, like, you know, hang a bit, hanging a big box fan, it's like a, a budget way to get the job done. Got it. Um, obviously, it's not as great as like having oscillating fans like mounted to the walls and stuff. But, um, you know, that's that's the way I was a budget grower. Like when I did my growing, you know, I was between the ages of 14 <laughs> don't tell my mom and uh 22 i wasn't just not, i didn't have a lot of money to, to to invest so i found you know cheap ways to do things that worked really well uh you, and you mentioned that you put your oscillating fan you know over the canopy and between the light it, another huge benefit there is those lights are putting off heat mm. and if you can just pull that heat right off uh, before it hits the canopy, that allows you to push those lights a little bit closer, up up to a certain extent. The closer that you can get the light, uh, usually means the the deeper that the uh, light will reach, and you know the denser the buds you can produce, up to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, that's a, a trick that I use: hanging the box fan. Cheap trick. Um, if you have the space, and you have like an oscillating, just standing pedestal fan laying around your house that you can just use you know grabbing that throwing it in there is a good way to 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 just uh, have a budget option um in the grow tent i think that if this oscillating fan thing is dealt with and like they have high quality oscillating fans that can clip onto the um the grow tent pole you know that's perfect but if they don't there's there there are um i think the monkey fan uh, there are fans that clip onto the grow tent pole that don't oscillate, but but still, you know, are small, compact, compact, uh, and and can push a decent amount of air into your, you know, four by four tent or whatever. Um, One thing to mention about that though is uh, you just gotta be careful to avoid wind burn, right? Wind burn is a real thing. Yeah. If you're constantly blowing air onto the plant consistently. The plant can have a stunt growth that dries out the leaves, the outer part of the leaves, and you'll see the edges start to, to, to brown and, and curl down and things like that. It happens to me. I've happened to me multiple times. And also, even with the oscillating fans, uh, uh, if it's blowing directly onto the buds, those white pistils, they turn brown and start to recede a lot faster due to the, the amount of air that's hitting them. So um, you'll notice that. I know there's, there's some growers who have come across so that. You're- in the past. So explain that to me again quickly. So like in uh, in what part of bloom do, is this a concern? Uh, I mean, really any part of bloom. I mean, I've been an early flower and I had an oscillating fan and every time it went to one side and blew, it was hitting a bud. And the bud on that branch, the hairs, the pistils went from white to uh, brown and, and started to recede. And then you look at the other parts of the plant and that wasn't the case. Now, wow. how much that's going to so, actually impact growth, I don't know. Um, but it certainly had stressed out the, the, the plant to the point where the, the pistols had turned color and receded. That's really interesting. I never thought about that, or um, I guess I just never noticed that. But it makes sense. I mean, obviously, the oscillating air is going to affect your VPD in the way that the, the plant is transpiring and, you know, drinking water. 
damn, I had something to say, but I'm losing it. Uh, oh, okay. So if you if you just have a carbon filter sitting on the ground, and you have a fan on top of it, like an inline fan, and you're just you know scrubbing air in the room, and you're sucking in air through the carbon filter, and then pushing that air s- straight up, um, it's a good way to get the CO2 that um, sinks to the floor hmm. back up and above your plant canopy. So that's like you know if you're not worried about if you're in a sealed environment and you have an extra carbon filter and a fan just like laying around and you're looking for a way to get like some circulation going in your room, you could just set that on the ground with the fan on top of it, blowing that air up, uh, you know, 24 seven, you know, another way to just get some circulation going in there. And it'll also, you know, that filter will catch um, some pathogens and uh, things other than odors that you probably don't want floating around in the room. That's interesting. I've never done that scrubbing method before. So I'd never heard of that. I think it's a great, great tip for sure. Um, when you're scrubbing, so uh, the, the only problem is if you're worried about odors, right? So if you're just scrubbing in the room, you're not creating negative pressure. So uh, negative pressure, for those that who aren't aware, it's basically, so if you have a carbon filter and a fan inside of your grow tent and you're exhausting air out of it, you may notice that the sides of your grow tent start to suck in a little bit. What that means is that no no air inside of that grow tent is just going to leak out of like the zipper or a hole or whatever. As long as you have negative pressure in the grow tent, all of the air that leaves the grow tent goes through the filter first. Now, if you remove that negative pressure, so you're, I'm no longer exhausting the air out of my tent I'm just, you know, scrubbing the air inside of the tent. I've got the filter on the ground. I've got the fan on the filter. It's just scrubbing the air inside. Um, air is going to, smelly air is going to leak out through your zipper, through your ports, through uh, through whatever. Um, hospitals actually use negative pressure rooms for patients. And basically anybody who, who may have some sort of uh, airborne illness or something, you know, they put them in a they put them in a um, negative pressure room. That way, the virus doesn't you know accidentally creep out of the bottom of the door of that room. The airflow is constantly creating a vacuum in the room. Uh, you know, so I think it's kind of cool how negative pressure is used in a, you know a hospital environment to to protect from uh, you know pathogens and stuff infecting humans, and it's also used in the growing world to prevent uh, odors from just leaking out wherever they feel like. So it's a lesson in negative pressure. <laughs> Interesting. That's good. That's good stuff. Okay. So I think it pretty much wraps everything up. Our uh, in, talk about environment. We talked about temperature, humidity, CO2, air circulation. Uh, this isn't everything you need to know about those things. These are just kind of a discussion that we're having, uh, you know, what we do for those different things to control those, those pieces of the environment. And uh, I think it's beneficial since, you know, we live in different climates. Uh, so talking about these things, definitely there's some things that I didn't know that you do, which is, which is awesome. And uh, I'm not sure if you knew that everything that I had talked about as far as controlling environment in, in the desert region. So um, it depends on which, envi- which climate you live in, Always, you know, feel free to make adjustments as necessary in order to get your environment's conditions into the ideal ranges. Yeah, and uh, if anyone really, if anyone has any different, you know, way that they deal with humidity, temperature, everything, tell us in the comments. Um, You know, this isn't the be-all, end-all. These aren't the be-all, end-all ways to uh, control your environment. And I'm sure there's things that we miss and stuff. So please comment in the description. Let us know, like, if we're wrong or if there's a better way or a different way to do something. Um, definitely want to hear it and um, you know don't forget to subscribe to my man Mr. Groet's page too (laughs) his his channel here yeah that's what I was just going to say is I would love to know how you control uh, your environment conditions everyone who's watching this let me know down in the comment section below let us know I love reading through that and just seeing that various ways that what people do in order to make things easier as far as controlling their environments so um Slap that down in the comment section below. Hit the thumbs up if you haven't already. Chris, how do they find you on social media and your website and so on and so forth? So our website's happyhydro.com. Uh, we're on Instagram at official happyhydro. We're posting on there, you know, 
a couple times a week and uh, we sell all sorts of different products on the site. Uh, if you do go to our site through the link in the description and buy something, Mr. Grow It gets a commission. Um, so you're helping support him um, and you're helping us. Uh, we are, you know, our goal is to just try to build a company that um, can, can get you your products for a good price quickly, accurately, and you know, give you an enjoyable experience along the way. I've dealt personally with a ton of companies that are drop shipping and you order it and you don't know <laughs> when it's coming. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, we're, we're trying to do things different differently and, and make people's, you know, shopping experience better and stuff like that. So uh, come check us out. Makes sense. I'll have links down in the description section below. Chris, thank you so much for coming on today and talking about environment. Thanks for having me, man. You know, I'm always nervous to do public speaking things <laughs> usually because I'm too lit, but <laughs> uh, I appreciate you bringing me on and we should definitely do this again. Awesome. All right. Have a good one. You too, brother. Thank you so much for watching this video. Click the video on the left to hear about grow room setup with baby J from the grow 420 diaries. And the video on the right is automatically generated by the YouTube algorithm. Until next time, peace.